And so today starts a teaching series on our great hope. What is it that God has promised for us? Now, many of us have grown up in faith systems, or even re- religion, so to speak, where it was all about what God is saving you from, from sin and death and brokenness, corruption, from your bad ways, whatever the messaging that was given to you. But, but oftentimes is underemphasized what God is saving us for. What God is saving us for, not just saving us from something, but for something. And we're going to talk about that for something, okay? In just a few minutes, I want to just prepare you. I'm going to ask every single person in this room to join in something together as a church. And we're going to do something corporately that we've never done here at UPBC, and I'm going to invite you to be a part of that. So be prepared at the end of this sermon, okay? Now, you may, may be new to UPPC, you may be new to faith, or new to the Bible, but it's important that you know that the last book of the Bible is the book of the Revelation. The vision, the revelation that John, who writes this book, is, has received. He's a bishop of Ephesus, which means he oversaw all the churches there. Last fall, many of you may remember that we spent some time in John's first few chapters in learning about the seven churches to which John was an overseer. But then continues the book with this amazing personal encounter that John has with Jesus Christ. He has a vision. And it says that he turned at one point and he saw Christ, Jesus Christ, and Christ put his hand on his shoulder and said, Do not be afraid. I'm the living one, the beginning, the middle, the end, Alpha and Omega. Alpha and Omega. Big deal. That's the start. The very beginning, chapter 1, verse 17. And then our Lord gives John this message to write on the seven churches. But now we're in Revelation chapter 4. And we're going to start to see what our great hope looks like. Now, the problem here is that in our contemporary culture and time, we have so many visions and so many pictures of what we think heaven will look like. And guess what? The surprise. Here's a surprise, surprise. Most of them are wrong. Okay? Most of them actually don't, don't fit anything that the Bible declares or shares about what heaven will actually look like. They're far better. But we have to go back to the source. Revelation 4 is the beginning of the rest of the book of Revelation which will be a vision that John experiences, and it is breathtaking, okay? So let's join in. We're going to look at chapter 4 today and what it looks like, our great hope. Starting with verse 1. After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. And at once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven and someone sitting on it. Okay. Epic scale. Epic scale already. Okay. Being thrust into the very throne room of heaven. You have to understand, in our day, it is, it is far more the equivalent of being taken to, on a private tour, to the Oval Office. To meet with the President. Okay. But this is far more uh, epic in scale. That's the scene. Verse 3. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. And surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. In front of the throne... Seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center, around the throne, were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. Let me pause there. This is fantastical imagery. It's, it's, It's impossible to really try to contain all that just got described, that was just described by John in his vision, for the throne room of heaven, okay? For the Oval Office, so to speak. But I need to help you with something here, and that is, this is an invitation. Let me offer a word of advice as we look at the imagery of the book of Revelation, and especially this passage. And the advice is this. Much of these spectacular images will not be interpreted to us. 
In fact, some of us have grown up in eras where people attempted to interpret all these facets, and they most likely are wrong, because they aren't interpreted by John himself, because they weren't the point, okay? The point is much deeper. Images are words like jasper or sea of glass, beautiful images that uh, evoke our imaginations, but the best thing for us to do uh, in reading these things is to stand back in reverence and imagine it but not try to interpret it. Okay. But then, there are things here in Revelation and this passage that are very clear, that are being interpreted for us. We're going to see one of them right now. It's the throne and the songs. The throne and the songs. The songs that will be sung in the book of Revelation are crystal clear. In fact, I'm, I join with Daryl Johnson and many other theologians who believe that the imagery of Revelation is less important than the songs that sing about Revelation and God. Handel was right. Uh, He chose the songs from Revelation as the main themes in his Messiah, not the imagery as much as the songs. So watch for the songs when we read Revelation. We're going to meet one right now that's very important. Next verse. Day and night, they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Verse 9. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. We sang of this vision, by the way. Did you notice it in the first hymn today? Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Now, a couple of, of points here. We do think that the 24 elders and their thrones with their golden crowns represent the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 leaders of the tribes of Israel, and then the 12 apostles. These are the great heroes of the biblical story, perhaps. Okay, But even they are not the point of the passage. They're pointing to something greater, okay? They're pointing to the one who is to receive the song. Holy, holy, holy. Who was and is and is to come. Now that is perfectly clear. And the word holy is something we don't use uh, in our day and age, but holy in the Old Testament and the New Testament was something that, was, that described the presence of God who is otherly. We are created beings, but he is creator. So God is otherly. He is outside of creation, his otherness. And the fact that he existed before creation. He is the Lord over all that has been created, including you and me. He is holy, and therefore he is set apart He is pure. He is beautiful. It's sung three times here, just as it was in Isaiah chapter 6. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, and who will be. He is the Lord of time. If you were writing in your Bible and in the the, uh, margin, I would write these words in block letters. What this vision is showing us is that this one who sits on the throne is the Lord of time, oversees all time, from the beginning of time to the end of time, from your time and from my time. He is the Lord of time. He is, as we learned at the beginning when John first heard a voice, he is Alpha and Omega, beginning and end. The Lord of time. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and Praise and thanks to the one who's seated on the throne. The 24 Hall of Fame leaders in the biblical story get up off of their thrones of authority and power and and what they have, have earned in their own right. They get up off their thrones and they worship the one who lives forever and ever. And what they do, these leaders who are worthy in honor of glory themselves, the word here used is diadem, diadem. 
It's used here to speak of their kingly crowns that they have earned, their crowns of authority, that they take those crowns. And look what it says they do with that authority. It says, they lay their crowns before the throne. They lay their crowns before the throne. And then they say this. They sing it, actually. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will. Wow. You created all things, and by your will. That means, by the way, for those of you who aren't familiar with biblical language, that by your will means it's by his decision. Jesus decided it. By your will is a very powerful word in the New Testament and the Old Testament. The phrase, and by your will, by your decision, means that God intended purpose. Not only is he the Lord of time, but he he created all things by his purpose. It wasn't like God just decided, I'm going to have fun and create a little Disneyland on a blue little marble in the galaxy and I'm going to roll the dice and just let it go, okay? And then they will, they'll you know, flitter out and, and figure out things on their own. No. By his will, he created. By his will. The Greek word we get here is actually develops into the English word existence. Creation. There is this existence where you and I were created, where the world was created, where the universe was created, that, that we exist by his decision. Not only is he the Lord of time, but he's the Lord of purpose. And he has made a decision. And so these elders, these leaders, these ones with kingly authority, place their crowns before him and sing to God the creator, the creator of everything, and by your will, it says, And by your will, they were created and have their being. By your will, they were created and have their being. Do you know what this means for you? This is the gospel. It means you're not an accident. By God's will, in his lordship, And authority over all that has been created in existence by his will, he created you. You are not an accident. You were created with purpose. By God's will, you were created and you have your being, your existence. So what these elders, these these. Uh, authority figures that have, have carried the story of the scriptures and of human history. What they're saying is, you're the Lord of all time, and by your will, all of us were made and exist by your decision. This is epic. There is a throne in heaven with Jesus seated upon it. And notice that every person in this scene has a crown and they place their crowns before the throne. Why is this important, friends? Why is this important? We need to understand is that this song in Revelation 4 is on a collision course with what is the predominant vision of our day and time now. In our age, the age of secular humanism, which teaches something other than a creator with divine plans but instead teaches what I call coincidental, purposeless creation stories. Coincidental, purposeless creation stories. That we really are, this is, this is the predominant message. If you ask people to somehow get down to the base understanding and teaching of what secular humanism is forming our children and our lives and our families around, is that you are an accident. It's a wonderful accident, but you are essentially a product of chance. There is no Lord of time. All that humans have is your own personal time. 
And you and I are told to create our own little kingdoms, and we buy little plots of land, and we put fences around our little kingdoms, and we go to West Elm or Pottery Barn, and we fill our little kingdom with furniture and things that, that define our kingdom. And then you're taught, you're taught from a young age to be true to your, what? To yourself. Be true to yourself. You are the Lord of your, of your life. You're the Lord of your own time. So you better find, this is the pressure that's, that's on every, by the way, this is the pressure that's on every child in our culture right now. This is the pressure. You better find your inner truth. You better find your inner truth. And manifest your truth is a phrase we hear a lot. You better manifest your truth and hold tightly to the crown that we're telling you you should create for yourself. That's a lot of pressure. That's a lot of pressure for any human being to have to hold, where you have to figure out the lordship over your own time, your own life. You have to figure out your purpose, your meaning, apart from anything grander than yourself. That's a lot of pressure. And I've said for many years now, how is that working, by the way? Here we are in this, the most evolved and technologically advanced culture in human history. Does it work? Just be honest. You may be uh, antithetical to faith. Maybe you're joining online or you're here today and you're just kind of like, I'm not sure if I buy it. But let me just ask you. Here we are, the most evolved and technologically advanced culture in human history. Does it work to have thousands, millions, billions of people living according to their own personal kingdom visions? living to their own truth and holding tightly to their own crowns or their own plots of land? No. I've said it many times, the 20th century is supposed to be the century of peace. Remember, we had technologically advanced out of warfare, only to become the worst 100-year history in human development and experience around life, expectancy, violence, and war. How is that? The song of chapter 4 here in Revelation is on a collision course with what our culture believes. With what you believe, perhaps. This means that the whole of existence, including your life, the life of your children, the life of your community, your neighbors, your friends, the whole of existence, physical, spiritual, all of it, is by God's decision. Is by the, the decision and the will of the Lord of time. God thought you into being. Not as a random act of, of experiential humanness on a blue marble in the galaxy. But for a divine purpose. And notice... That the song is ascribing to him something about his worthiness because his decision to create undergirds everything in the created order. He is the one who's holding it together. That means that, means that this world has meaning. Everything has meaning. That's our great hope. If you are to write the first great hope, everything has meaning if we understand that the Lord of time is holding our lives in his hands. Everything has meaning. That's our great hope. The throne room in heaven informs the real you. Created by God for a purpose of God. A life with meaning and destiny. A life that at one point is destined for and Jesus is so longing for and looking for the day when you come face to face with him at that throne. And you join in that song, holy, holy, holy. But the problem that we face in that is it requires one thing of us. It requires the same thing that the 24 elders must do. What is that? That we too must take our crowns, these crowns of accomplishment and, and graduate or undergraduate degrees and, and 401Ks and all of the trophies and awards and, and self-fulfilling, the, the beautiful families perhaps that we've been able to create in our life. Whatever it may be, we have to take those crowns too and we have to lay them at the foot of him who made us. And we too have to join in that song. 
we get to join in that song. Now here's what's, what's beautiful and also amazing. It, it's, a, it's a mind job to try to figure out what this means and what this looks like. But this vision also says that right now, Jesus is sitting in that throne room. And he is ruling and reigning over all of creation from that place right now. And he can't wait to leave that throne room and come back home. You see, he is the one who is and was and will be, but he will be coming back. And we'll be seeing that later on in this series as we look at the joining of heaven and earth in the grand vision of our great hope. Now, Jesus is in that throne room. He is still speaking. He is still reigning. But that image can sometimes make us think that Jesus is distant, that his otherness has taken him far away. No, not so. Just like we sang and read about the dwelling place of God, God is chosen by God's Spirit to make his dwelling place among his people, to have movements of God happen from his, within his people and from his throne room, that he would move and that when we put our hope and our trust in Jesus, despite all the brokenness we see around us in this world, that Jesus is redeeming it. And he is working right now. There's a movement of God. God longs to and he speaks. He longs to speak and he does speak. And so that activity of the throne room is wanting to move into our lives. So I want to talk about a movement of God right now for us here. I've mentioned this a couple of times now that I feel like there is, uh, and, and I'm just going to step out in faith here. Uh, I've had some people who have said, I, Aaron, I think you're right on this. I think a couple of different people have felt like, yes, I think this is true. Is that there are some of us where it's been some time since we've heard from the voice of God. And some of us haven't experienced a movement of God in our lives for quite some time. Maybe the dust has gathered on your expectation of Jesus in his throne room being at work and moving in your life. That the Lord of time maybe stopped working in your time. But the Lord of time wants to work in all time. He wants to work in your time. He wants to work in my time. He wants to move. He wants to speak. He wants to act. And so I want to talk about a movement of God for us as a church that would shake the dust and get us out of perhaps a stronghold of apathy and to expect that the Lord of time would move and act in our time. Are you with me? Some of you are tentative. You're like, what's coming, right? Okay. <laughs> Just let me get there. Okay. I'm inviting everyone here today to join in something we've never done before at UPBC. Even if you're a guest, if you're a longtime member, I'm inviting all of us. Because you were meant to be in this room at this time. Starting today, I want to, you to join me in a seven-day prayer and fasting for the movement of God in your life and in this church. A seven-day prayer prayer and fasting for the movement of God in your life and in our church. That the Holy Spirit would speak and that our ears would be awakened and that we could shake off the dust and do some work of removing our crowns and putting them at the feet of Jesus. And it starts today. After you have your lunch, I hope it's a big lunch. Mine is going to be. This is a seven-day church-wide fast until next Sunday. Okay. Biblical fasting, as Jesus described it and practiced it, was, it was the act of redirecting your physical hunger for food to a hunger for God. It's been co-opted in so many ways in our culture today. That's not what I'm talking about. I want to just set this up. Is fasting from fruit in the Bible occurred really around three different things. First was fasting for repentance. When you fasted for, for desiring and needing forgiveness in your life, well, then you would, you would fast from food, and you would ask God for repentance. There was fasting to, if you don't uh, remember this, some of you may not even know this, fasting to mourn, to grieve, 
Fasting when you'd had experience of loss or death in your life. Some of us don't even know that we can do that when we've lost a loved one. But that's, a, that's the second of two forms of fasting in the scriptures. The third is fasting for a movement of God. Fasting for a movement of God. When the dust has gathered and you feel like, I, 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 I want to be a part of what God is doing in his throne room in this time, in this era, in my life, then people would fast for a movement of God. And today, you're going to receive a prayer journal to accompany your fast. And you may need to observe all three of these things. Repentance, a grief, and a movement of God, perhaps. But together, we would do this. Now, as you receive this, you you may want to observe all three. But what do we fast for? I want to direct this real quick. To worship the Lord. Our fasting is to worship the Lord and to place our crowns at his feet. Some of us need to place the crown of our marriage at his feet. Maybe your marriage is struggling, or you're buying the lie, or you're starting to absorb you know, TikTok or reels that are telling you, maybe it'd be better if you got a divorce. You need to place that crown at the feet of Jesus. And you need to pray and fast. Some of you, it's a major life decision, maybe a career decision. Maybe it's a relationship with your child or a loved one. You need to take your crown and place it at Jesus' feet and say, I want to hunger and thirst for what you're telling me and your movement in my life. Fasting is not, newsflash, is not about losing weight or doing a cleanse. Those are benefits, of course, for spiritual fastings, but it's not the reason. So you don't step on the scale. You don't, you don't do that work. Now, I also want to be clear here. I'm not talking about a loose use of the word fast. There are two fasts you can do. A water-only fast or a Daniel plan fast, like the, the plan that's in the Old Testament, 10 days uh, Uh, that uh, we read of that Daniel plan where it was just raw fruits and vegetables. Raw fruits and vegetables or water-only fast. That's one of two fasts I'm talking about. Whichever you think would work. Now, for those of you who are diabetic or hypoglycemic or have a prescription that needs to be taken with food, or you you just need to do what's best for you. Adapt if you need to. If you are uh, breastfeeding especially, you need, to, you need to check with your physician or just do some reading on how you can do that. You can do it, but, but, uh, but you need to read on how to do that in a healthy way. But uh, I don't want anyone in this room to walk away thinking that nothing is an option. Whatever you do, I want you to engage in some sort of hunger fast where you thirst and hunger for God. I'm not talking about a a fast from TV or social media. That's not fasting. That's adulting. (laughs) This is a spiritual fast. St. Augustine says that fasting is a laying down of one's crown at the feet of Jesus by this. Listen to what he says. Fasting cleanses the soul, raises the mind, subjects one's flesh to the spirit, and renders the heart contrite and humble. Isn't that beautiful? This Lent, this beginning of Lent, this season that we're in, we're, I'm serious. I'm serious as a heart attack. Some of us need cleansing. We need our vision lifted uh, from the lowly to the heavenly. We need our gaze to lift from the circumstances of our lives to the throne room of heaven and to redirect the desires of our flesh to the desires of the Spirit. And the result is, friends, is humility. It's humility. Many of us need something to trust in. We need to to change the way we're trusting. To trust in the one who is and was and will come again rather than our own self-preoccupation. Arthur Wallace says this, When exercised with a pure heart and a right motive, fasting may provide us with a key to unlock doors where other keys have failed. A window opening up new horizons in an unseen world. And it's like he's describing John's vision of heaven. An unseen world. That really is at work in all facets of the world. And if we have the right motive, a fasting of this week will be the key to unlock some doors that we've really been struggling around. The movement of God in our community. For strongholds to be broken in our lives and in our community. And to rightly order things by directing the hunger we feel in our bodies to a hunger for Christ. 
what he longs for in us and around us. I want to invite you to grab this after the service. Ushers are literally going to force this into your hands. I already know what's happening. I know this because just so you know, your pastor did this several weeks ago. I wanted to get ahead of it. I wanted to anticipate what is it going to be like for my people. If I'm going to ask you to do something, I wanted to be able to say I could do it and that I did it. Okay? And I'll tell you, right now, right now, as I present this vision of God speaking in your time and in your life in this week, you're already trying to find an exit plan. You're already looking for the exit door. Well, what about that dinner with friends on that night? Don't tell them you fa- don't do don't don't be telling people you're fasting. Keep it quiet. Just tell them I'm not hungry right now, but I'd love to join you, and I'll have some tea or water, and uh, or right now I'm just going to have some vegetables for this dinner meal. Whatever. Okay. Don't tell the world about it. This is between you and God, and in in conjunction and in partnership with the brothers and sisters you're sitting next to in this room. And imagine next Sunday how our hunger for worship together will be. The hunger that will be in this room, literally. But will you put your body in its place and let your spirit take priority? And will you let your vision and your gaze move from this time to the Lord's time? And will you pray and join me in this prayer journal for a movement of God? I'm hoping most of you will do this. And that together we could do it as a community that longs to live into the great hope of heaven now. And that we could proclaim the goodness of Jesus as we sing holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, and place our crowns at Jesus' feet. Let's pray. Well, Lord, this is a, this is a weighty call and task, and yet this is the work of us reordering and rightly ordering our lives around you. And so would you speak and act? And would you give us uh, the courage to step out in faith through prayer and fasting this Lent to start living into our great hope? Thank you that you're the Lord of, of time. You're the Lord of our time. You have given us purpose and meaning, and you have given us a mission. Lead us in that work. And would you provide a word and a movement in every human heart in this room this week in our time I pray and all God's people said Amen